Good morning. How are you guys today? Good. Uh, my name is Senna. I'm going to be kind of moderating this fantastic panel today. But as a, before we get started, thank you for joining us for Beyond the Entrance. You're going to hear from some local institutions who are implementing accessibility into their exhibits and programs and much, much more. Uh, the Arts and Cultural Accessibility Cooperative, which I'm just going to call the AC, AC from now on, um, seeks to create a resource for the community that will allow us to continually move forward through discussions and committed work to create a more inclusive arts and culture scene for our region. We believe that the St. Louis arts and culture community is for everyone and all deserve access to the city's cultural landscape. And we seek to empower the community to become more accessible to people with disabilities as visitors, patrons, artists, employees, and volunteers. So we thank all of you for being here today and for supporting um, our mission. And we also wanna thank uh, Deaf Inc. for providing our ASL interpreters today. So we have three panelists who are just going to talk a bit about what each of their institutions do. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're going to be starting with Rhonda Shear. Rhonda is the Chief of Museum Services and Interpretation at Gateway Arch National Park. As the National Park Service and its private partner, City Arch River, now known as Gateway Arch Park Foundation, planned a full park revitalization and the construction of a new museum at the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, universal design principles were paramount to the function of the new building and the vision for the new exhibits in order to create an inclusive museum environment. Shear is going to talk about the challenges, the solutions, and the extraordinary group pro process in preparation for the grand opening July 3rd of this year. Next to her is Nicole Smith. Nicole is the membership coordinator here at the Missouri Historical Society. Her daily job is to transform visitors' love for the society into membership, but her efforts don't stop there. And I can attest to that personally because I work with her and she does a million and one things here. Um, in her eight years here, she has served on many exhibit teams, written for the Society blog and member magazine, worked with numerous community partners, hosted over 100 events, and has probably been on every committee you could possibly think of. One of the most important aspects of her work is making the society more welcoming to all visitors. In her accessibility work, she has helped push the focus to not just meeting physical accessibility standards, but creating avenues for intellectual accessibility. Finally, we have Jason Roberts on the end, video producer of Deaf Empowerment Awareness Foundation, Inc., also known as Deaf Inc. With more than 10 years in video production, he specializes in creating videos that provide access for the deaf community by incorporating American Sign Language and adding subtitles or captions. This specialization led to Deaf Inc.'s new service, Vizdio, which is a combination of visual and audio. His previous projects included partnership with the Missouri History Museum here on their exhibit Route 66, Main Street through St. Louis, and also number one in civil rights, the African American Freedom Struggle, which is still open upstairs, so you can definitely check out all the Deaf Ink stuff that's in there. These projects were a factor in the museum being awarded the American Alliance Museum's Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Inclusion Award uh, last year. He currently works with several museums and vendors using Vizdio's services to make their museums and exhibits accessible to the deaf and hard of hearing community. So with that, we will get started with Rhonda. And it's all yours, Rhonda. Good morning. <laughs> so welcome to this very special program. I think this is a fabulous initiative for this group to come together and have these conversations and help us support and spearhead all the accessibility projects and um, solutions that we're facing in all of our destinations and museums and cultural attractions. So this is um, my fourth park with the National Park Service after many years as a classroom teacher. I worked at Mount Rushmore National Memorial in South Dakota and um, in Philadelphia at Independence Hall, home of the Liberty Bell, and then Valley Forge where George Washington encamped with the Continental Army and then now um, Gateway Arch National Park in St. Louis, Missouri. <coughs> you will notice I just used our new name. 
Um, our park was formerly known as Jefferson National Expansion Memorial, and um, it is one of 417 national park units or national park sites. Uh, there are very many um, different designations, including National Historic Battlefield, memorials, monuments, <coughs> National Scenic River, waterfronts, lakefronts, shores, shorelines. Um, we think perhaps someday the agency will actually go to calling all of the units a national park. Um, we've discovered that it's very helpful for our visitors to understand the association we have with the National Park Agency. Uh, because it's an urban park, I often get people greet me, greeting me on the sidewalk going, I didn't expect to see a park ranger here. Um, when the park revitalization is complete, we will have six beautiful new agency identification signs, the ones that you line your family in front of for the picture, for the photo album and the Facebook post that says the name of the National Park. So it'll be kind of fun because people will have a new awareness of this urban park as a National Park Agency <coughs> member. Um, so my sign language name is Ranger <coughs> Rhonda, letter R twice over my badge. Um, kids call me R2. <laughs> when I worked at Mount Rushmore, I was R3, Rushmore Ranger Rhonda. <laughs> So um, my job is to be um, the team leader for a group of professionals and volunteers who um, I like to say research and reveal the significance of our, our um, natural and cultural resources in our national story. So um, half of my team, you can pretend you're the half, that are the historians, archivists, curators of the collection, librarians, mm -hmm that gather from historic evidence, primary sources, um, oral histories, uh, whatever's available, to gather and, and um, compile and preserve the significant history of our country and our city, and our global environment as well. And then you can imagine, you're my other half of the team, um, picture yourself as the, the folks who reveal the history. <laughs> Um, as park rangers, park guides, education staff, volunteers who meet and greet the visitors and find innovative, creative ways um, to help people make personal intellectual and emotional connections to the significance of our park and our stewardship and our preservation models and help people explore all the multiple perspectives of history and the human experience. So um, with that in mind, we have accessibility at the forefront. Um, thanks to all of our uh, members of the Universal Design Committee and our citizens groups, and um, I call our friends the uh, local residents who are generous with their knowledge of accessibility. We have learned a lot. Um, we've understood a lot more than we ever did before about our challenge and our responsibility to make things ex as equally accessible as possible for all of our visitors and to welcome everybody into our national park and welcome everybody into Gateway Arch National Park. Um, I'll give you a little bit of teaser. One of our biggest challenges was how do we provide as equal as possible an experience to the top of the Gateway Arch. How many of you have ever ridden the tram car, the 630 feet? Very good, excellent. Um, you understand there's a lot of stairs at the top. You can imagine the small individual capsules that um, aren't large enough to accommodate a wheelchair. So with our committee groups and our brainstorming sessions, we came up with something that we think is going to be pretty good. I'll tell you more about it later. But um, I love to have our um, interpreters help me demonstrate the tram car ride to the top because it's a combination train, um, elevator, and Ferris wheel as the little car writes itself as it goes to the top of the arch. So there's lots of ways to demonstrate that as a Ferris wheel and the fact that the car writes itself over the top of the curve. Um, so that's just one of the biggest challenges that we face. I'm gonna start with some photos that kind of illustrate, what do I point at? <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to be sure to um, include a picture of the arch itself. Um, this um, illustrates the beautiful stainless steel um, monument that was built to commemorate the expansion of the country into the American West and to um, honor all the people who were impacted by that westward expansion, all the overlanders, all the American Indians who were the original inhabitants, all the travelers that came through this city to stock um, their supplies for their covered wagons. It's a big story. 
And so um, you might recognize um, there's two rangers in the front of the arch, R Ranger Rhonda and Ranger Paul. Uh, how many of you recognize the apparatus we have in front of our eyes? <laughs> this picture illustrates Rhonda and Paul holding the cardboard solar eclipse glasses. How many of you participated in the solar eclipse? Excellent. Did you have some interesting venues at which you observed this phenomenon? Who would like to share a couple of venues that you were participating in? We, at the St. Louis Public Library, we had, uh, we saw the eclipse from the steps of Central, but we also had uh, classes at all 15 of our neighborhood branches. Excellent. How fun is that? <laughs> would anybody else like to share a venue at which you participated? We hosted an event at World War Sanctuary. And yeah, the whole thing was interesting. We were kind of wondering how the birds were going Ah, very good. Yeah. And did they? Uh, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> lots, of, lots of insects that we observed coming out. Uh, so you could hear? Yeah, did you say you heard birds at your site? The owls, the owls, yeah. The owls did, yeah. Really, really an amazing event. So this is the kind of thing where we experience in our outdoor environment. How do we be fully accessible and help this event be um, available to everybody um, through a variety of senses? So I think it's interesting. I use this as a symbolic representation. This is an exhibit technique. This is an interpretive tool with which we help people make really stronger connections to a phenomenon. Well, as you all can imagine, what happens when you put this on in this situation? What do I see? Anybody want to say what do I see? Not much. Not much, <laughs> as in nothing. This is designed to help people make connections to that phenomenon. But by itself, putting it on, I don't see anything. So that's the irony of what we're doing to help people connect through our exhibitry and our props and our techniques is maybe we build something that's absolutely fabulous, but it's not going to help the accessibility for some of our visitors. So we say, how do we do this then? Um, how do we make this accessible for the fact that it's only going to help the people that can take that upward glance like we are in the picture, looking at the phenomenon and seeing it that way? So um, as I like to say from Jason, if I pronounce it right, Bizdio. The combination of visual, visual and audio. I ask you, and I ask my staff, how would you imagine you could describe what you see at the solar eclipse? In your mind, how would you describe the visual image of looking at the sun in the shadow through the solar eclipse glasses? And then there was lots of media there. There was a lot of film technicians. There were a lot of audio recordings. So the media story went out. We have a lot of media people here who share through media. Mind's Eye and, and Jason's organization share through media what we see and feel and do and hear that's associated in many ways that people can catch on to the story. My staff also talked about the fact that we did hear birds twitter as if it was dust. That was part of the experience that we can share with visitors. Um, did any of you have the awareness of the temperature change during the solar eclipse? Oh my goodness, the temperature dropped. So there's lots of ways to share through lots of different sensory experiences what the connection is to the phenomenon or the significance or the historical event. If sometimes the exhibitry is not cutting it, we have to find a workaround to involve as many people as we possibly can. Another example, this is um, Ranger Rhonda on the stage at the Blues at the Arch, a wonderful concert series sponsored by our partners, Gateway Arch Park Foundation, national and local um, jazz bands. And um, I'm not usually under stage lights. I like this picture because the foreground shows from the back, Ranger Rhonda with her arms extended, leading a chorus in song. Um, the stage lights indicates the setting of the venue of a performance venue. And what's in the background? Oh, the gorgeous stainless steel gateway arch. So what we want to do is share the message and the mission of the National Park Service during our 100th anniversary celebration. So I said to my staff, how should we do this in a unique, innovative, fun way? We decided we needed to have um, me as the narrator say to the crowd, welcome to Gateway Arch National Park, an urban park of 90 acres on the shore of the Mississippi River. And Steve Freehu, my musician on staff, uses the trombone to do a flourish. Ba -ba 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 -ba. And then I say, 
Welcome to the story of America's settlement of the West and all the people who lived here and struggled here and triumphed here. Now I'd like you to help me with trombone flourish, if you would. Then Steve Free who went, ba 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 boom. Okay, how about a keyboard flourish, a drum set? Think about a guitar flourish. And I say, welcome to our celebration of America through the legacy of jazz and other wonderful musical presentations. Ba 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 boom. So what we're trying to do is make music accessible to all the people in our audience. We call it universal design because not only does it help the people who need that special accommodation, it's helping everybody in the room. It's helping everybody experience at a higher level what it is we want them to connect with. One more time, everybody. Ba 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 boom. So what a great visual. The trombone is a great visual for the, the rhythm of music. So is a drum set, so is a guitar. So it's lip reading when you see our wonderful soloists sing God Bless America, and you can see how the lyrics of the song are presented audibly. Um, also, when Rhonda Ranger is leading the crowd in the chorus and the sweeping of the arms, you can sense the music and the lyric and the rhythm and the beat. That's accessibility. So, We'd like to celebrate the natural world and the nature and the eye of the sky and the water of the Mississippi River and the landscapes and the ponds and the hiking trails, but we also have to go inside. Oh, this is a, uh, another view of our, uh, of our other very special feature, the uh, historic courthouse. And this beautiful um, dome in the background of the historic court cases. And in the foreground, we see lots of kids coming down for all these um, wonderful outdoor activities, backyard bird count, um, celebrating the monarch butterfly, canoe mobile. Um, so that's all part of our outdoor experience. But this is what I really love that connects to what Rachel told me the session was, is beyond the entrance. And I said, oh my gosh, that's what we're doing. We're moving indoors. This is the new glass entrance to the new museum. This is all you see above ground because all the exhibit galleries are being constructed underground. It's this beautiful glass front the glass goes from floor to ceiling in an expanse that from the inside of the building, you get that view of the, of the courthouse. So this picture shows me leading a media tour as a preview of all the different exhibitry and the accessibility um, options that we've incorporated. And it also it, it demonstrates this concept of the free flow connecting downtown St. Louis to the Gateway Arch to the riverfront. So, um, Beyond the entrance is our challenge. Now what do we do when we go inside with six new galleries? Okay, here's a great picture of uh, some of the members of the Universal Design Team. <coughs> these are local citizens. These are professionals in the accessibility world. These are people helping us grapple with all the different ways we can make all of these exhibit experiences accessible. This is us looking at the cardboard solar eclipse feature going, it's not gonna work for everybody. What's the workaround to make it work for everybody? And so we have um, David demonstrating full front accessibility to our exhibit stands. Um, we have Ray Bloomer, who's been an expert in this um, for many years. I love Ray would say, let me take a look. Ray is blind, and he'd say, let me take a look at that model. Let me take a look at this tactile. Let me take a look at this 3D map. And he would look at everything with his hands and tell us if it was working. Um, we have Dr. Stephen Kissel, who was at the last session here very helpful in helping us understand from his perspective how the intellectual and emotional connections were being made possible through our exhibit features. Here's um, David measuring for the reach and the height of all of our exhibit stands to make sure that they were accessible and that everything was within reach on our electronic <laughs> monitors. This I love, this is Naomi and Farby. Farby came to all of our meetings and um, people took turns taking Farby for his little walks outdoors and helping him have his morning and afternoon snack. Here's um, Naomi testing out the tactile of the small bison. Um, we have the large bison, but you know we want people to feel all the features and get a sense of the animal structure. So this will be on display in front of the large life-size bison. I love this picture because we have Ann Putubiolo, who is our Harper's Ferry Center um, expert on all these things, and she's got her arm linked through Ray as they're having a side conversation. And again, you can see people gathered around the exhibit table who are sharing ideas on how to do things the best way possible. I call this picture, who's a good boy? 
How many of you have pets and you say, who's a good boy? And this picture is a nice close-up of Farby with um, Naomi's hand giving him a little loving pat and, a, and a, a comforting reassurance during these long meetings. Um, here's Dr. Kissel testing for the monitors. We have the um, input devices by um, buttons that have to be described to all of the participants so they can take deeper dives into these monitors and choose different menu selections and learn more details about, for instance, the peace medals. This is the levy model that demonstrates the city in 1849, a full um, representation of five blocks of the levy waterfront. And so these models are all um, designed to replicate that experience along the riverfront. And here we've got the 3D tactile um, that shows with the small raised section in the lower left-hand corner what the entire exhibit feels like, then the larger tactiles that give you the sense of the 12 volts in the buildings, and then there's larger tactiles where you can feel all the details and take a look with your hands of all of the different steamboat features. Here's Devin, a good picture Jason said Devin had to see, because we said, Devin, this is a good picture, um, helping us with our interpretation um, of the different monitors. This is Bill, always sharing his story through our uh, interpreters about his family history and his connection to our stories. And this I love, Colleen, I have no idea what this exuberant moment was, but I happened to catch it on camera. We had a lot of fun, there was a lot of joyful moments as we had solutions and, and made um, new friends within the community. I call this new friends, Colleen and Devin and Rhonda. These folks were just so instrumental in helping us understand where we needed to go and what we needed to do. Um, the museum contract was put into place before I arrived, and we began to learn that we had not met the needs of the deaf and um, hard of hearing community with ASL video. And so um, the Park Service said, we will find a way to seek um, funding. Um, we met with superintendents. I met with regional staff in Omaha. We found a funding source. Um, we're very excited to be able to, to say that fiscal year 2019, which actually starts in October, we will be able to put a, a bid request out for competitive bids on ASL video um, to accompany our exhibits. So um, organizations like the one Jason works for and others will be able to submit their plan and their budget and their bid so we can incorporate American Sign Language video for all of our exhibits. This is a statement of, of purpose and mission. It is the goal of the NPS to ensure that all people, including the estimated 56.7 million citizens with disabilities, have the highest level of accessibility that is reasonable to our programs, facilities, and services in conformance with applicable, applicable regulations and standards. We are there, all the agency is there, parks are doing self-evaluations on accessibility. We have a long way to go. The way we can make progress is with the consultation with our friends. Here is an example of our goal to fill in the blanks. This is a picture of Vanna on the stage with the screen on Wheel of Fortune um, with the puzzle of a landmark, a special place. You see a few letters in place and a few letters missing. Who would like to complete the puzzle for the bonus prize and the trip to Hawaii? What does it say? <laughs> Fabulous. So accessibility is filling in the blanks, doing the workarounds on the exhibitry, making sure that we're welcoming all people and that we have a way of making all the blanks be filled with our features to make it successful. This is the all-in philosophy of the National Park Service. We are working on it and we thank you for all your help and your support. Hi everyone, I don't know if I can follow Rhonda, but I'm certainly gonna try. Um, thank you all for coming today because if you didn't know, you're in the Missouri History Museum and you're about to hear about the accessibility of the Missouri History Museum. Um, just by a show of hands, who has been in this building before to hopefully go to an exhibit? Most everybody, fantastic. We did some rebranding and our tagline this year is find yourself. So if you haven't found yourself here before, please come back and find yourself here in one of our exhibits. Um, so if you don't know much history about the Missouri Historical Society, we started in 1866. I'm not going to give you um, over 150 years because that would take up our entire day. But so 1866, um, fast forward 
to um, the 20th anniversary of the passing of ADA. We had a small, and when I mean small, a very small exhibit um, that was in about a third of our one of our gallery spaces, and it was our first accessible exhibit. Um, that was before I started here. So when I actually started here, it was already up. It was, it had braille in it, it had some audio in it, and it had some touchables. And that was the first time the Missouri History Museum had done any of that. I was actually talking to one of the designers who's no, of that exhibit who's no longer here, um, but I was talking to him last week, and we have both learned so much that looking back on that, we're just like, oh, that wasn't really that accessible. There's so many things we would have done differently, but we don't have a time machine, and if, even if we had a time machine, that's probably not our first thing on our agenda, maybe the 10th. Um, so we had that. After that, we formed an accessibility committee of staff here at the Missouri History Museum, and we also brought over staff from our library and research center on Skinker. So it was supposed to be one person from every department, and when it first started, there was about 20 people on it. I will say, after this meeting, we are leading an accessibility committee meeting um, at 10.30, and that's whittled down to about eight people. Um, for your institutions, who has an accessibility committee just of staff? Okay, well, what you should do is go back and, if you can, form some semblance of accessibility committees. Um, so we did that because we really wanted to focus on accessibility, and I will say that I recently looked at those notes, and it was really a lot of physical accessibility, not intellectual accessibility. I know when Senate introduced me, we used that term. I don't know if everyone could gleam what that term means, but so physical accessibility is when you get in the building. By ADA standards, every visitor should be able to get into all of our institutions unless maybe you're a historic home, and there's so many rules, I won't go, go into that. Um, but, so if someone comes into your building like they should be, if you don't have any way for them to connect to what you're showing or what you're trying to do, why would they leave their house and even try to get into your building? So intellectual accessibility is connecting your exhibits, um, your talks, your programs, to make sure it's available to everybody, and hopefully someday, um, so no one has to self-identify and call ahead, that you just have it set up and someone can walk in. Um, so like I said, about seven years ago, we formed an accessibility committee. I will say that it was mostly physical accessibility, but we really got the ball rolling on intellectual accessibility about two and a half years ago. So I'm going to get to my first slide. Okay, so we opened Little Black Dress a few years ago, and Little Black Dress was an exhibit that had 49 dresses in it that were all black, and um, we had amazing attendance rate. It was really great, but we decided that we wanted to have tours in it for everybody. So we started doing quarterly tours in ASL, and we started doing quarterly tours in descriptive audio. Now, the descriptive audio is we had we have about six staff that are trained in audio description. So what Minds Eye does, but we have some of our staff that is also trained. Probably not as good as Minds Eye, but we're we're working on it. Um, so what happens with those tours is we have it led by a curator, and then we have a staffer that does audio description for all the things that you'd be able to see. I have been the person that's been doing the auto description of those tours. Um, I will let you know that our ASL tours are, um, they're, they're all free, all the tours are free, but our ASL tours have sold out. We like to keep them small, we like to keep them with only 15 people max, so they can have a really good experience in the exhibit. Um, our descriptive tours, not so much. 
Not so much because we're the only museum in town or cultural institution in town that is doing quarterly tours. It took us a while, two and a half years, to really spread the word. And now I will say that we've had one that's the highest attendance has been seven people. But I will say every tour I've led, we have one person at least that's never been to this museum. And if that's true for anybody, I don't care if it's just one person at that tour. If that gets people in the door to experience our collection and learn about history, I'm all for it. Um, and it doesn't cost us anything at the museum. Maybe some extra electricity for the lights to be on, um, but that's neither here nor there. So we did that, and that was a step in the right direction. But then we started really looking at our exhibits and we said, we kind of need to work on this. We need to make them built in more accessible so someone can just walk in and have a great time. They don't need to call ahead and register or go on the website and see when we're going to have these quarterly tours. So for the last two and a half years, we have made it our mission to integrate touchables into every exhibit. I will say that if you go into the civil rights exhibit upstairs, there are no touchables, but you'll also see that there's maybe two artifacts. So if we don't have that many artifacts in there, we don't really have models to then base touchables on. Um, but our panoramas exhibit, we do have touchables. And after, I actually have the screens we made down in this room. So if you would like to see them, um, come talk to me after this, speak, after this talk. Um, so we did that. And I went to this conference that I go to every year now. It's called the LEAD Conference. It's Leadership Exchange of Arts and Disabilities. And it's led by the Kennedy Center in DC. It's like accessibility summer camp. It's so much fun. You don't have to explain what accessibility is. Everyone just already gets it. So you can really get down into the nitty gritty about it. So one of the sessions I went to um, really touched me in a way that lit a fire out of me. And it was about, you need to have as much things as possible that someone doesn't have to call in or request for. I don't know what I'm doing in two weeks. I doubt you guys know what you're doing in two weeks. But for sign language interpreters, that's usually the standard when it comes to cultural institutions. And it's in the tiniest print on the back of your calendar that says, oh yeah, if you need this, give us a call or send us an email and we will get it for you, but it has to be in two weeks. Someone that doesn't anymore, um, I won't mention this institution, it may have been my own, um, used to say you need four weeks, which is ridiculous because if I don't know what I'm going to do in two weeks, I definitely don't know what I'm going to be doing in a month. So I came back from the conference and I said, we need to work on this. Can we, we already have the quarterly tours can we have like one program a month that has an ASL interpreter that's in our calendar and maybe beef up that print to not the smallest print in our calendar that says, if you need somebody, just give us a call and maybe whittle that down to one week. Um, and some people got it and some people didn't. And I was like, it's all about self-identifying. Maybe someone doesn't want to let us know that they need something, but also maybe they are they don't know if they can come to a program and they're like, that sounds really great. Or maybe they see the program the, the, the day before and they're like, well, it's not two weeks in advance. I was told no. I was told no because we didn't know how much that would cost. And that was going to be an additional budget for the year. And I didn't like that answer. So what I did, and I thought about it and I wondered if I could for the next calendar year figure out how many events we would need an ASL interpreter for. If I could put that out, then we could just build that into the budget for next year. And I worked on that. I will say, luckily, um, for this endeavor, I have a coworker whom is deaf. So we already needed a, an interpreter for him. So it wasn't a foreign concept, but for public facing, it kind of was. So I put a bid together that had everything my coworker needed and everything we needed for an entire year for our public facing programs. And I bid it out to three organizations that do ASL. Um, no, I actually bid it out to five and two places told me that that was an, an option because apparently I was one of the first cultural institutions that had asked to be billed for an entire year of it. 
Um, but luckily, three people said yes. It's new, but we'll work on it. So we reached out, and what we ended up going with is Deaf Inc. Um, and I reached out to them about that, and then they came back to me that said, we want to do this QR thing in your exhibit, which Jason will talk about, so I'm not going to st steal his thunder. Um, but we were just like, we kind of understand what you're saying. Can you come and have a meeting with us? So they came and had a meeting with us, and it was amazing and we love the idea so just by reaching out to a provider we got what we wanted plus other things that we did not think about um so that has been going at every exhibit since route 66 which was the exhibit after we had little black dress so that has been going for a year and a half now so all of our exhibits if there's audio or a video with audio um we have a qr code that you could scan with your smartphone and a video of asl will pop up which is amazing. And then we have the rights to the video so then I can go for tracking purposes into the video online or wherever it's stored and see how many people have actually used it, which is great so I can show people are actually using this service for us. Um, so right now we have one to two public programs a month and we have quarterly tours in ASL and we have all the audio. So that's for the um, our visitors who are deaf and hard of hearing, and then we just only have the quarterly tours in audio description, but we're looking to expand upon that. Um, I think, oh, it's like, I think I may have talked about all my slides and not progressed them, so sorry about that. One more thing is we went, worked with Paraquad, which is where we had our first ASA, yeah, A, 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 C, A, C, A, C, A, C, acronyms. Um, ACAC meeting and we were able to luckily plan for this to say hey next year we'll have enough money and that was two years ago to do an audit so we did an audit of this building's public spaces and our library and research center and skinkers public spaces to make sure they were actually physically accessible and I will tell you that I don't know when all of your facilities were built, they're probably not still physically accessible because since we have built our new building in 2000, there has been some <coughs> changes to what ADA standards are. So we found out that our ramps are slightly um, to the greatest too um, big. Steve, that's the better word. Greatest too steep, thanks. Um, so we figured that something like that is not going to be fixed until we remodel, which who knows when that will happen. But we had some really easy fixes that said, the coat racks in your restrooms are too high. If you're in a wheelchair, you can't do that. Well, that was really easy. That was just a work request to facilities. So it was things like that to guarantee that, you know, we were kind of focusing on the intellectual accessibility, but guarantee that we were also physically accessible to everybody. Um, so we did that. It was great. We also had them come in and then do a complete report that took almost three hours, but was a lot of amazing information about everything that we could change. And then we sat down as our accessibility committee that is all staff and prioritized it to what's going to take the most money, but what's going to then not cost money, but take the most people power. And we came up with a like five-year plan of how we can hopefully do most of the recommendations sans remodeling our building. Um, so that was really, really beneficial to us, and that's something we've done in the last two and a half years. And then I talked about the Duffing Project. And then our latest exhibit that's on the floor right now is Panoramas. So if you haven't been to that exhibit, we have about, we have seven large panoramas. The longest one is 30 feet long. And then we have 57 smaller panoramas in there. So it's very visual. And if you cannot see, I don't know why you would go into that exhibit. So we really had to think about how to make that accessible. So what we did, as I talked prior, we have um, six staff that are trained in audio description. On our committee, we decided that we are going to take a crack at doing audio description for the seven main photos in there. Luckily, we have 230 staff and we have so many things that so many people are talented at and we also do a lot of audio for our exhibits. So we have an in-house 
recording studio. So this entire project was, didn't cost us anything except for people power. So there was five of us that wrote the audio description for the seven panoramas. Then we, um, they all turned them to me and I edited it to make sure it was in the kind of the same voice and it actually was doing the best audio description of the photos. I gave it to our publications so they could check for grammatical errors and also make sure it's in a better voice than I ever could because I don't work in editing. And then we sent it to, we chose a staff that was going to speak, so it was all in one actual sounding voice. And then we were able to record it and then put it on our audio players that already existed. So they haven't been used super prevalently, but they have been used. And I've heard some really amazing stories from our docents and our guest service staff about people that have come in that have been that have visual impairments and or blind that have been able to actually take some of the stories with them. And we do have touchable panels um, that can are not in the exhibit in the exhibit, but they are movable, and that's why I can show you at the end of this meeting. That's just the seven panoramas. Um, so we, again, we try, but there's so many more things that we could be doing. I sometimes think that we're not doing enough, but then people have to tell me, Nicole, we're doing as much as we can, as fast as we can. Um, I would let you know though, that one quote, and I tried, I searched my apartment for my notes literally two hours last night to try to find this quote and who I could say said it. But I went to this session at the conference I mentioned before, and there was a neuroscience that had done some work with the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And he said um, this, he said, I know that I don't like opera, but I know I don't like opera because I went and was able to experience it. So I would give that to you that like, you don't know if people are going to have fun in your institution, are going to connect with what you're trying to get everyone connect with. If you don't give everyone the opportunity and the tools to experience what you're trying to get across. So I try to keep that in mind all the time, every day, but especially when I'm going to accessibility committee meetings to learn about exhibits. Um, so that is what I can tell you. Thank you so much for having coming, and I'm going to turn over to Jason. All right. So I'm going to stand up to sign so I don't injure Nicole here. Give her some space. Could I have the clicker? Thank you. All right, I'm sure you all did not expect a title like this for my presentation. Look, Big Loud Train. So the title of this is Imagining a Child Going to a Museum and Seeing a Big Large Train on Exhibit and to communicate the mood that that child would be experiencing. So like it's already been said, I work for Deaf Inc. Vizdio is a department of Deaf Inc. And the reason that we came up with Vizdio, which is visual and audio, made into another word, is because we're trying to make audio visual for deaf people to have that experience, like those who can hear. So accessibility features to satisfy the deaf and hard of hearing community. I know the word satisfy can be difficult because you think, well, I'm not sure how to satisfy people. I'm not being given possible solutions for those who may not be satisfied. And a possible solution that I have to offer you that could satisfy most of the community will come up in my presentation. Now, around the country, current design includes these, these options. The first three are more standard for, are offered and they're standard, but they're really aimed towards those who are hard of hearing. Transcripts and captioning are a great option for museums to offer but it's not in a deaf person's language. The emotion's not there. So just reading text doesn't allow the deaf person to have the same feel and experience as someone hearing the audio. The last one, ASL tours, like Nicole was saying, that's a great option. However, that had, has to be scheduled in advance. And so if, for example, I had a friend flying into town, you know, because they had a delayed flight, so they have a layover, and they want to really quickly come into town with me and see the museum and the arch, well, if I have to give advance notice, my friends miss out on that experience. So, 
how can we improve the experience for the ASL fluent community? With today's technology, we have so many options. And one of them is American Sign Language videos. It works. So these are some images from videos we've worked on for other museums. Um, one of the museums that we worked with, of course, is here, the History Museum, the Civil Rights Exhibit, and the Route 66 Exhibit. And some of these images are from those exhibits. And Devin, you can see the image behind him, the bottom middle image. He's signing about the exhibit, and then behind him is Washington University. So I'm getting the exhibit, the information of the exhibit, the emotion, the inflection, um, visually from him and having the image of the institution that's being discussed as well. Very different than reading text alone. Deaf people use American Sign Language. That's, that's their language. And the World Federation of the Deaf said that there are 70 million people worldwide who use sign language to communicate. American Sign Language is the sign language used in the United States and Canada. So the videos that we provide are accessible for all of those who use American Sign Language, not taking into account specific dialects or local signs, but the sign language that American Sign Language choices that we make work on a national level. Similar to spoken English where you have pop or soda, it's still understood either way. And like Rhonda was saying, the way that you sign tram can be signed a few different ways, but any of the ways would be understood. And with these American Sign Language videos, you're able to express, again, that emotion. I have a friend who gave a presentation and compared music to, music to American Sign Language. And she said, if you imagine using your hands to play, a key, to play the piano, you have each of your fingers plays a different sound. And that's the same in sign language if you assign a feature of ASL to each finger. Um, once you make small changes, you change the whole meaning. So the example I'm going to give is of a train. Here's a happy train, an angry train, or someone in awe of a train. All the same sign, but different meanings by the way that I signed it. And you can also show time in addition to sound using the same sign, just in the way that you express it. So, so much more is included in American Sign Language than text alone. You can do sound like this. If it's loud, it's a larger sign as opposed to a smaller sign if it's quiet. So deaf people grasp the sound that's included in exhibit as well. So you're including all of the senses. And the last point is it's easily accessible for any vis visitors. The, visitor, the videos could be posted on the wall. You could have a platform set up with uh, a monitor playing the video. You could have a QR code that a person would scan and it would come up on their device. There's also augmented reality or AR. And so that's where someone would take out their phone, scan a given image or picture, and like sort of like facial recognition, it would scan that image and bring up a video on their device. So different forms of technology that can be used to show these ASL videos. So sign language is also not just for the deaf and hard of hearing community. It can be accessible. It can be used for people who are who have autism, who have Down syndrome, that utilize sign language to communicate. Also, it's important to remember that sign language would be something that deaf children would be able to to utilize. Like I remember when I was a kid, I went out to the Arch, and they have that robot. I believe it was William Clark giving a presentation, and I remember staring at his mouth. And my teacher came over and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to lip read him, but I don't think he's, I don't think he's speaking English. And my teacher said, no, yes, he is. And I said, but is he bored? There was no facial expression either. So if I had had a video, I can only imagine how in awe I would have been if that had been provided to me in ASL. So imagine providing that experience for deaf children going to a museum or any child that uses sign language. I mean, it would just be amazing for children who have autism or Down syndrome or who are deaf. It would enhance their museum experience. So more than just the deaf community alone. So I mean, I know it went kind of fast, <laughs> um, but I think, I think that's it for me. I wanted to close on a quote that I find really impactful. Um, it's a powerful quote and it pretty much speaks for itself. So it's exactly right. 
I mean, it, it touches, me, touches me to my core. This is exactly true. So thank you for your time. All right. So, um, yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? If you do, please go ahead and raise your hand, say your question, and I'm going to repeat it um, before our panelists can answer. Yes. Um, this is a question for Rhonda, Ranger Rhonda. Um, your, um, your tactiles, the, the, uh, the maps, the cheap, not maps, I'm sorry, the um, touchables, mm -hmm. thank you, that word. the touchable, who made those? What company did you work with? Well, our um, museum fabricator specific studio. Sorry, Rhonda, could I say that question really quick? Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, sorry. She was just asking Rhonda about who created the um, touchables at the Gateway Arch. Good. Um, our museum fabricator and installer is Pacific Studio in Seattle, Washington. And then some of their tasks go to subcontractors. I'm not really sure who was the final um, fabricator of that, but it's all through Pacific Studio who was awarded our contract um, for the exhibits after um, competitive bid. Go ahead. Uh, this is a question for Nicole. I know that you guys do some of your fabrication in house. Um, how is that managed? Um, she was asking Nicole about the fabrication that we do here at the museum in house and how all that plays out and how that's managed and handled. Great question. Great question. Um, so I will say that in the beginning, so two and a half years ago, all of the touchables were made by our same staff that puts together the exhibit, so it was all in-house. Um, but I will say that we are moving away from that to where we are bidding out different companies because we want to do so much more than we're currently doing and our staff does not have enough time to do so. The touchables that you guys can see of our panoramas today, we worked with a company from Arkansas that is escaping my mind right now, but it's on the box that I can tell you <laughs> after this meeting. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm wondering with the QR and AR that require the use of a smartphone, if you found a workaround for people uh, living with disability that are in poverty or for young children to make it more accessible to everybody. Uh, she's asking about if with um, AR codes and other scannable items that require a smartphone, if you all have come up with a workaround that addresses people who may not have access to a smartphone or who come from, uh, who have disabilities and may come from areas of poverty who don't have access to that. I will say that we have talked about buying, um, not smartphones, but tablets that can also scan. That is something in our future, but that's something we don't have currently. So we, while we do realize that issue, we've only been doing it for two and a half years, so I would have to... Like, we're fighting with the data we have because I can show that people have used them. Um, and that is in the future. I just don't know when we'll actually have those. Exactly right. Exactly, yeah, exactly what Nicole just said. Um, it could be a smartphone or a tablet. Um, usually, usually, people with disabilities are, have um, access to programs that will provide smartphones or devices if needed. There's a TAP program as one example. Um, so, Nicole was mentioning that the facility might be able to purchase devices to have on hand, but a lot of people um, with disabilities prefer to have their own device, not something that they have to borrow because there might be issues with it not working. If it's a device that they bring in themselves, they know they're familiar with it and they know it'll work. I will say, I know you just asked about the QR codes, but the audio tour that we have as well, we have our own devices that someone can check out, but also, as they just said, with the disability community, they would probably have their own devices and they know their own devices better. So we actually have a link on our website website to um, our SoundCloud page and you can download those for free. So then you can just download them onto your own device for the audio description. <clears throat> Hi, I, this is wonderful hearing everything that everyone is doing. You guys have talked a lot about um, the visual impairments and blindness, but is there anything for low vision specifically that you guys can talk about? 
Uh, she's just asking if, uh, with all the work you all do with um, those who are blind, you want to know if there's anything about for low vision visitors specifically. We had a lot of really interesting conversations and tryouts with um, the people on our team. And what we came up with is a solution for um, our exhibit cases where we're going to have um, enlarged print, enlarged text. For the people that want to need to um, read close to their eyes like this, or people that have the visual scanners that can read. So we had quite a bit of debates with our um, group about how large the font would need to be on a wall panel to make it accessible for people with low vision. And you know, we found ourselves getting very, very, very big with the letters. And it, a group consensus was, well, let's just make sure we've got a lot of large print cards with each display, display case. So that's one of the options that we came up with. One of the options that we have done is, and I will say that we don't have them for every exhibit, and it's kind of cumbersome, not on our staff, but on someone that were to use this. I've gone through all exhibit labels and made sure that it's white paper, has black text, it's an aerial, and then it's 18 point. But we have a lot of text in our exhibits, so then you have a binder that is this thick that then someone can walk around with. My dream would us to be able to do that and then make those labels av available for free so someone could not download them because that would be a huge download, but access it through like a cloud system on their phone or a tablet that we would have, but we're not there yet. I will say other than text and also not having your text labels have a dark background with white lettering, have it be the opposite to where the background is lighter and the text is darker. There's that, but like our touchables are gonna work for anybody. But yeah, when it comes to the text, that's what we've done. It's in no means a perfect solution, but that's what we're doing right now. And also, um, you mentioned about those with low vision. I know with Roots, the Route 66 video, um, we were trying to think of all, all of the different disabilities that appear within the deaf community. And so one of my friends who actually has Usher's syndrome and is also deaf, he told me that he really loved the video and I asked him why. And he said using his own phone, he has preferences and settings adjusted in his phone so that he's able to utilize that video in a way that works for him by the fact that it's on a device that he can you know, bring closer to his face. Go ahead. I, I know that you guys are consulting your exhibits every once in a while. Do you have any recommendations for people who are updating their material monthly or possibly weekly to make it accessible? Do you have any recommendations for places that are updating their exhibits or materials monthly or even weekly? Yes. So if I don't know how large of an exhibit you're speaking of, um, maybe it's not the ideal version because in the ideal place, everything would be accessible all the time. But if you are changing what you're doing so rapidly, maybe try to focus on your key messages and maybe five spots in exhibit or something like that and make sure you have large print labels for that and accessibility portions for part of the exhibit to really get the message through um, unless you have this, the staff power to do accessibility and changes every week or every month, but no one does. So focus <laughs> on doing a few things rather than all or nothing. One of the things as an agency that we're um, currently going through is making sure all of our documents on the internet are compliant. And so that's it resulted in a, in a directive to take down anything that is not visually compliant and replace. So that's quite an um, interesting challenge. And um, that includes things like the um, audio description requirement too for video. So I would say perhaps a good thing to do is choose one document that's gonna summarize, are you referring to like temporary exhibits that change over a course of time or? We have content because the garden is constantly doing yeah. new research and that kind of thing. We have changeable slack walls that oh, yeah. we update with current materials uh, and are always trying to bring those stories kind of to the table. Right. So it's a lot of like, hey, the newest research out this month, or sure. your 
here's the species highlight yeah. for right now. And so trying to make that really available is one of the challenges because right. oftentimes we barely have time to get the signage. Right. That's what I was saying too. Like the like in addition to the things that Nicole is suggesting is figuring out what the priority is for an internet post immediately to have that wide outreach with your um, compliant documents <laughs> as well as a um, compliant um, audio described visual of some kind just to load and go and have have a pattern in place to try to replicate every month. Choosing the priorities is always the challenge. And also, um, I. I remember um, I had a meeting with another museum and they said they switched out their exhibits frequently like you're mentioning um, and talking about switching out QR codes they thought would be a challenge. So we um, talked about establishing a standard QR but then the video would switch out. So this, the QR would be static and then the link would switch up for what that QR code was actually connected to. So that they could have a static QR code set up in place, and then whenever you switch out your images, that QR code stays, but then the link that it's attached to would change, and so they would link up to that new information. And the museum that I talked with said that they thought that would work great, rather than having to, you know, print out. I know the History Museum is able to print out their own um, their own uh, materials here because they have the publication department, but that might be an option. I saw, oh, go ahead. One thing I would say also, and I know that getting your entire organization to buy in is sometimes very difficult, but if you are changing things frequently, maybe have it built into changing things frequently that accessibility matters. So when they start to get that information before they even make the print for the slat they're going to change say when you start proofing that right after it goes like right after it's in the like goes to publication it's the correct wording then the next step rather than show it to the public is to have an audio description or have big print like everything built in so there's an accessibility portion of everything you do no that's a big dream but that could be something to help if you're changing it very often Yes, I think I saw your hand. We've talked a lot about um, exhibits. I was wondering if there were any unique accessibility challenges that cropped up when dealing with events, especially in sort of one-time event that you may only have one shot to get right, um, other than your standard ASL interpreter, audio descriptive services, and accessibility. Um, how do you all handle instead of just exhibits, but like programs or one-time events that happen and how do you handle um, addressing accessibility with those when you only have one chance to do something? So I speak from experience that we have had some events like that. We had a 25th anniversary of ADA event throughout the whole museum and on our grounds. I will tell you that someone's wheelchair broke in our grand hall. Um, during that event, and I had to find a screwdriver and fix her wheelchair while she was in it. It was really fun. Um, we're best friends now. No, we're not. Um, but you have to, on the front end, while you're planning that event, before the public gets involved, like make sure that you are planned, you are have everything in plan, and maybe too prepared, if that is even a thing, before like you think of how... If you're having a huge event and you want every ability to be there, think of how someone that has this type of disability and this type of disability and this type of disability will be able to have the best experience. And if it's a huge event and you're like, this is going to be so massive, reach out to local resources in our community because I don't know if you guys know this, but surprisingly, St. Louis, we have so many accessibility services that you could say, hey, we're doing this. Do you have any um, advice on what to do? And you know what? Those people want St. Louis to be as accessible as possible, so they're going to give you, hey, you should do this or think of this. Um, they're luckily, with the exception of a wheelchair, hasn't been any disasters. Um, but yeah, just think about through and through. But also, um, it's all about buying again. Make sure your events department, the people that are leading that events, understand how important accessibility is. I um, also, via the conference I talked about earlier, um, I went to a session about 
accessible events. So then I came back and decided to make like an accessibility checklist. Now, all of the staff does not have that, but some of the people in our events staff does have that. And it's as simple as like, do you need an ASL interpreter? Have you told Nicole to book it? Or um, have you, or to the complicated stuff, where it's, um, have you thought about increasing um, our accessibility parking spots, like blocking it off and making temporary signs that says this is accessible parking, like those kind of things. I just have a suggestion. I worked um, as the director for the Disability Project Theater Company for a while, and I say bring people with disability into the conversation and into the planning because they are the experts. It's much easier to bring people into the conversation than to try to think in a way that you don't have to utilize every day. So on that note, bring some weight. <laughs> uh, the committee, the Universal Design Committee that was pulled together, I recognize a lot of those folks um, as just really um, instrumental in the community as far as accessibility. And I wonder, and I, I applaud you for using that committee because just they were asking the user what do they want and what would make the most engaging. So is that committee still formed? Or you know, how would any of these institutions go about utilizing that universal design committee in the way that the Arch did? Uh, she was asking about the universal design committee that the Arch had and how they went about like creating that group and how to utilize them and um, find the right people to be involved with it? Yes, I can see where they would be instrumental in future success in other situations. I think maybe anyone who's interested, um, send me an email and I'll put you in contact with the, the um, leaders of the group, they have not um, wanted to actually name a chairperson. There are people that sort of rise to the challenge of being the leadership without being an actual chair. But um, I think just it would be a matter of uh, giving you contact information, a couple of key names, and um, asking for their support and seeing if that would be the existing group that happened to be formulated for our project, or if maybe there'd be another group that was somehow put together. But um, I think it would be just very um, congenial for us to say there's more people that want your input and, and put you all in contact with each other. Um, how much more time do we have, Rachel? Sorry. <laughs> okay, great. I have one quick thing to add to that. Um, you guys have a much bigger committee. We're opening the Soldiers Memorial in November. We have a smaller committee in the arts that does that. And I, the reason I bring that up is Remember that these people that you're asking to do all these things mm -hmm. for free mm -hmm. are people just like you are. They have jobs, they have kids, they have families, they have other commitments to just your cultural institution. And try to figure out ways to make it worth their while. Maybe if you're gonna have a meeting, provide food for them. Maybe if you are a place like we are that has membership, give them a free membership. You're asking someone just like someone would ask you to contribute to huge ideas to change your institution, but for free. So please keep that, that in mind. Yes. Could you talk a little bit to um, how many exhibits you will have in your new area and about how long it took to um, incorporate and work with that community? Um, she asked Rhonda about how many, ex like how much exhibit space and how many exhibits are going to be in the um, Arches Museum and, oh gosh, I can't remember the other half, about, oh, about how long it took working with the um, Universal Design uh, Committee on those exhibits. I can easily say hundreds of exhibits because, um, you know, imagine all the artifacts and display cases, all the text panels in six different galleries, um, all of the computer monitors with interactive deeper dives, I like to call it. And then we also had another contractor for all the media development, Aperture Films out of California. So we reviewed everything that was created for the large screens, full motion video, all the um, animated maps, all of the um, monitor base computer generated um, linking programs. So hundreds. And I've been on it for two and a half years. So I've been here for two and a half years. And you know, when, when I 
interviewed for the job, my superintendent said, um, they called back to say, we just want to double check with you that you understand that besides the normal chief of museum services and interpretation duties, you'll probably be in exhibit um, design review committees and fabrication teams about four days out of every five. So we're getting, it, it's it, the immersion of the general first um, steps was huge for us. And the committee will stay in, I think, did you ask this for someone else? The committee will stay in place to help us through the assessment stage um, of figuring out how things are working and what things need to be modified and, and where we need to go with that. But, um, you know, I just think it's with anything else. You figure out the priorities of what's the best first steps to take. And if you have the capacity through staffing and volunteerism and management team, how much time can you put into making it work? But um, it's been an amazing experience because of how much we've learned. And a phrase that I heard from a colleague at the regional office last week I just loved, um, she happened to say, a lot of times we don't know what we don't know. And this reminds me of so much of the conversation here, like Jason was this, it, describing the ASL videos. Two and a half years ago, this exhibit team for the Gateway Arch Museum thought that the text panels that the deaf community could read was sufficient. All the information's right there, right, in every single gallery. So it takes this really uh, crucial conversation from all the stakeholders and all the representatives to help us learn, as Jason was representing, the emotion and the comprehension and the, the other levels of what the understanding is through ASL video was something it took the team a long time to get to because we didn't know what we didn't know. Mm -hmm. So there's that aspect too, is what you want to dive into and, and take as the um, some people call the low-hanging fruit and then where you go from there through the physical accessibility, through the intellectual accessibility, to the large event, in innovative creative approaches that we haven't thought of yet. So. Did you find that what you learned as you were working on the exhibit then sort of translated quicker into the other ones? Perfectly, yes, what a wonderful way to sum it up. It was, it, it was, the pictures I like to show of the team is that it was a growing, learning, dynamic team of every step of the way we go, oh, aha, yes, we learned that last time. Um, when you ask about the visual things, we learned so much about um, uh, contrast of colors and the fact that, whoa, there's something in the background there of the overlaying text that's not gonna be visually clear, so we gotta remove that, move that over. and. Everybody kind of developed their preferences on what was working and what wasn't. I wanted the whole story to be told in these visuals, and Rhonda's special need was don't remove the horse's head from the graphic with something else that overlays it, because I want to see the whole horse. So everybody on the committee had their preferences, and then we learned to load and go those same preferences through the whole process. Save the horse. <laughs> Uh, one more question. Yes. Uh, are there any challenges you've seen or experienced creating interpretation services for programming that may be um, in a different language, cultural programming, maybe in the Japanese or Chinese culture, trying to get that across? Um, asking Jason about how they deal with creating. Um, like interpretation or these products for other languages that aren't English and how they handle that. I've actually had that question before. Um, we actually, my company specializes in American Sign Language. We thought about adding on other languages. Um, there is a universal sign language. Um, and if someone is interested, we are able to outsource that, uh, that need. But typically, um, typically a deaf person, typically a deaf person will be able to understand a different form of sign language more readily than a hearing person would be able to understand a different spoken language because there are visual concepts that are similar, whereas spoken English and spoken you know, French, for example, it would be more difficult for a hearing person to catch on to. So they already have that sort of advantage, deaf people with sign language. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. And special thank you um, to this place where, <laughs> sorry, where me and Nicole work, um, just for having us here and giving us this awesome space. Thank you to our 
fabulous interpreters um, and for Deaf Inc. And also for our description by Mind's Eye. And of course, to our lovely panel, Ron and Rhonda, Nicole, and Jason. Um, and I'm Senna. And uh, if you want to post something about us on social media, don't forget to mention us. So hashtag ACAC, which is a lot shorter than the full name. Uh, <laughs> and um, just remember that if you are interested in uh, joining the ACAC, um, if you want to become more involved, you can email Rachel at Melton at mindseyeradio.org nice and that is Rachel as well so if email's not your thing she's right there um, and don't forget to um, come and join us again in June at uh, Wells Fargo Advisors we're going to be talking about website accessibility so I'm sure that's going to be a fantastic session as well and there's still various munchies yeah. and beverages in the back so please grab something on your way out and don't forget to check out the exhibits upstairs but don't take food in them there we go. All right. Thank you, guys.